Hello friends, welcome to Sunya IS. Myself Pratik. Today we are going to discuss the geography questions of UPSC mains 2022. You people would have already gone through the paper and you would have seen that there were eight questions from the geography section. These were the eight questions. The first four, five, six, seven were for 10 marks each. Then if you talk about the question number 14 to 15, they were for 15 marks each. So before we move ahead with the analysis of this, I am very happy to inform or share this information with you that during um, in between the prelims and the mains, we conducted the crash course at Sunya S. In that crash course, we covered few static topics and in that also I informed at the start I'd write at the introductory lecture uh, while beginning with the geography section that every year every year from geography there are somewhere around eight there are somewhere around eight to nine questions asked by the UPSC in mains every year and the weightage of geography is somewhere around 90 to 110 marks last year it was 110 marks this year it was 100 marks fine so 100 marks directly from the geography section and during the introductory lecture i also said that most of the questions from the geography section are based on the static part of your syllabus based on the static part of your syllabus. So if you look at the questions, the first question, primary rocks, the second question, yeah, second question was a little bit of, uh, you can say a current oriented, but the third question, deck contrap, that is peninsular India. Then if you talk about the uh, seventh question about, it is talking about the wind energy, then the 14th on ocean currents, 15th on rubber, then 16 on straits and isthmus. This was little bit application oriented and 17 again the troposphere. So if you eliminate the question number 16, which was uh, an application based and uh, this color coding. So 10 and 15 marks if you are eliminating. So 25 marks. So if you go back again, 75 marks was directly from the static part of geography. Right? 75 marks was directly from the static part and if you would have gone through the uh, GS crash course lecture if you have seen the GS crash course lectures in these crash course the crash course of GS geography was the crash course of GS geography at Sunya S it was of just 15 hours so in that 15 hours, I have covered most of the static topics. And if you have gone through those videos of 15 hours, you'll find that three questions, three questions were directly from these 15 hours of lectures. Three questions were directly. So you just had to invest 15 hours and you would have easily caught these three questions. They were taken directly directly fine the first question was about the primary rocks this i took in mains crash course lecture number two in which i talked about the igneous rocks and i also mentioned the other name as the primary rocks and in this i discussed all the different types of primary rocks then uh, this was bit current oriented question number five then if you talk about the question number six about the Deccan trap, this also I took in lecture number eight, geography mains crash course series. In this, I talked about the significance of the peninsular plateau. And here it is simply asking about the natural resource potential of the Deccan plateau, which is almost the same. Then uh, the wind energy, again, this was in our GS1 booklet of Sunya IS. Fine. Then the ocean currents. The ocean current what are the forces that influence the ocean currents this i took in lecture number six in which i basically talked about the forces the primary forces and the secondary forces so if you look at the crash course series which was of just 15 hours and all this content was discussed and provided in the crash course 
so if you would have gone through these 15 hours you would have been in a very ready position to write the answers for these particular questions the ocean forces that are influencing the ocean currents the primary and the secondary forces then if you talk about the uh, uh, potentials of the natural resources which was already discussed minerals fertile black soil then uh, forest economy tribal home etc etc fine then uh, the rock cycle in which uh, i talked about the different types of rocks as well so you would have easily been in a good position to score the best marks in these three questions fine so if you're talking about 75 marks from the three questions were directly from our crash course series so that would have easily helped you fetch uh, 20 20 and uh, 10 10 uh, 20 and 15 or uh, so total 35 marks so out of these 35 marks let's say if on the higher end you would have easily scored somewhere around uh, more than half let's say somewhere around 20 marks okay you would have easily scored somewhere around the 20 marks then if you talk about the entire geography section as i've said it is mostly uh, based on the static part so if it is a static part so if you are covering the 100 marks then out of 100 you would have easily scored 55 to 60 marks only from the geography section only from the geography section fine so geography has a sorry so geography has a good amount of weightage when it comes to your mains paper it also has a good amount of weightage for your prelims as well because if you would have gone through the paper again the question the this question discuss the meaning of color coded weathering warnings for cyclone prone areas given by imd this was more of a prelims oriented question okay and this question was also covered in our test series uh, rflt4 test series r flt4 okay in this the question number eight it is talking about the different color coding warnings color coding warnings given by the imd and in, in explanation part we have uh, there are already these color codes present there are already the green yellow amber red already these color codes are present so you can utilize your prelims content as well as your mains content for writing best answers fine if you have already gone through these things then it becomes quite easy to write the answer because if you have seen the paper apart from geography the other sections like the history the indian society it requires some amount of thought process so it would have easily consumed some more amount of time in writing those answers but if you have if you were already prepared for this but if you are already prepared for this static part you would have been very easily able to write the answers okay once you complete this section then if you would have moved on to the other parts then no matter how much time it is taking you would have been in a very good position to some score somewhere in between 95 to 110 marks okay because this 100 marks would have easily provided you with a score of around 55 to 60 marks so geography holds a good amount of weightage and i have always stressed that most of the questions in geography are from the static part of the syllabus fine so let's start with the discussion If you look at the question number four, the first question was describe the characteristics and the types of the primary rocks. So here you can give a brief introduction about the primary rocks. You can start by giving the definition of the primary rocks. What are primary rocks? Okay, they are the first rocks to originate. They are the first rocks to originate on the surface of the earth on the surface of the earth fine that is why they are also called as the primary rocks fine the igneous rocks are the first rocks to originate on the surface of the earth that is why they are also called as the primary rocks in 10 marker question i have always stressed that in 10 marker question the introduction should be of only a single line okay try to maximum you can extend for two lines okay in 10 mark question do not try to write lengthy introductions 
one or two line of defamation will be more than enough fine so here you can simply write they are the first rocks on the surface of the earth then you directly jump on to the body part what has been asked because here there are two parts two sub parts that has been asked first it is asking about the characteristics then it is asking about the types so if you go on to write all these things in 150 words the sp space available will be very less so make a thumb rule in 10 marker question uh, you will write introduction of only uh, only one or two lines of introduction fine then you directly jump on to the characteristics what are the characteristics of the what are the characteristics of the igneous rocks so igneous rocks are nothing but basically they are the hard rocks basically they are the hard rocks okay then you can talk about the uh, size okay they vary there are various sizes variant in size of the uh, igneous rocks okay there are varieties of igneous rocks depending upon the place where they are cooling okay because we know that uh, there are two types of basically there are two types of igneous rocks the intrusive and the extrusive rocks okay so the igneous rocks which cools uh, inside the surface of the earth they are called as the intrusive whereas those which cool on the surface of the earth they are called as the extrusive so depending upon their position and the location there are different uh, size of the igneous rocks then we also have the different layers okay if you talk about the uh, igneous rocks they are in a layered structure okay they are in a layered structure then another characteristics you can talk about is the absence of fossil fuel fossils sorry absence of fossils in igneous rock you won't find fossils because the igneous rocks are formed from the uh, molten magma okay so because of the high heat uh, all the fossils they simply melt away okay? so there is absence of fossils then these are basically volcanic rocks these are basically the volcanic rocks so likewise you can write the characteristics put subheadings hard rocks variant size and give some examples and your uh, character characteristic part will be done then you jump on to the types okay if you talk about the types there are different types of igneous rocks the first if we talk about the they are based on the amount of the silica content okay based on the amount of silica content based on the amount of silica content we have two types we have the acid igneous rocks and the basic igneous rocks acidic and the basic igneous rocks okay acidic the best example is the granites best example is the granites and basic if you talk about the best example is the gabbro fine then on the basis of the um, mineral mineral composition you can talk about on the basis of mineral composition they are classified into mafic okay which contain magnesium in high amount then we have felsic which contain iron in large amount then we have the pegmatic okay so these are the different types of uh, igneous rocks based on their mineral composition then we already talked about the location or their occurrence on the basis of their occurrence we have the different types as the intrusive and extrusive intrusive and the extrusive so likewise you can write the characteristics and the types of the rocks fine and your task will be done then you conclude it appropriately by you can give the significance of the igneous rocks okay significant uh, significance you can write about uh, their characteristics um, igneous rocks being quite hard fine they are utilized in as a construction material so if you can give a significance as a conclusion part that will your task will be done fine then there are uh, various minerals that are obtained from the igneous rock like feldspar quartz okay amphiboles and mica okay all these are 
obtained from the igneous types of rocks right so try to try to uh, uh, structure your answer well and make sure that all these things they have to be already you have to already prepare okay you, most of the people would be like ha yaar itna aasan question tha hum to ye aaram se likh lenge padh ke no you have to practice it right from the day one of your preparation you have to practice from the day one of your preparation all these are static part so whenever you are reading the geography try to think of the different types of questions that can be asked or you simply after covering one particular topic you simply go back to the previous years questions of uh, gs1 paper or uh, geography you look at the questions and you try to write the answers for them fine so if you are practicing them then and then only you will be easily able to write about these uh, questions in the examination because writing this much of information would have hardly consumed your hardly 4 to 5 minutes okay hardly 4 to 5 minutes you would have been able to write the answer to this particular question if you would have already been prepared fine so make sure that you are making a habit of writing as many answers as you can fine this was as i said this was directly asked from our crash course section fine then if you talk about the next question the next question was on the discuss the meaning of color coded weather warnings for cyclone prone areas given by imd now this question was little bit of current oriented and i spoke with uh, most of my friends uh, who gave mains uh, who are writing mains uh, this year and most of them were not able to recollect whatever information they have read during their prelims time but try to apply logic in such type of questions i can understand saying this uh, sitting at home uh, reading this uh, question in a very comfortable position but if our mind is clear if our logics are quite clear then we would be able to write at least some information about this and at least fetch two to three marks rather than scoring nothing okay there are people who have simply skipped this question or they have written something very or uh, you can say irrelevant thing irrelevant color codes but always remember about the traffic light okay in any such type of color coded thing always remember about the traffic lights the traffic lights yellow orange or amber and the red okay if and finally we get the green so if we are not aware inhi cheezon ko likh dete yaar hmm? green safe theek hai yellow cautious orange little bit of alert then red very high alert fine so even if you would have written these as the color codes then also you would have been easily able to score somewhere around 4 marks fine people those who will write something at, at least there will be people who will be writing only about cyclone okay kuch nahi pata to cyclone hi likh ke aa jao at least they will rather than scoring zero they will at least score one mark okay kuch nahi milne se acha at least uh, cyclone ke bare mein likha to at least you will score one mark so it is very important in such type of question when we are not aware of anything try to write at least something theek hai try to write at least something अगर कुछ भी नहीं पता थोड़ा सा लॉजिक लगा लेना ओके ट्राई टू अप्लाई सम लॉजिक एंड स्टिल यू विल बी एबल टू स्कोर बेटर मार्क्स फाइन सो हियर इट वाज आस्किंग अबाउट द डिफरेंट कलर कोड्स दिस क्वेश्चन वाज कवर्ड इन आवर प्रीलिम्स टेस्ट ओके इन आवर प्रीलिम्स टेस्ट क्वेश्चन नंबर 88 इट वाज टॉकिंग अबाउट द कलर कोडेड वार्निंग्स एज इशूड बाय द आईएमडी देयर आर डिफरेंट कलर कोड्स गिवन बाय द आईएमडी for example we have the green color code uh, which is given pre cyclone no severe weather expected and no advisory is issued okay we have the uh, green where we do not have any okay no warning is issued then we have the yellow we have to be little bit of cautious we have to be little bit of updated about the weather then in case of the amber we have to be extra cautious and we have to prepare ourselves to the upcoming disaster or the upcoming climatic event fine and red is indicates that we have to undertake some sort of action 
okay some sort of action it is basically in case of cyclone it, this action is in case of cyclone this action is basically a post landform a uh, landfall okay post landfall action right post landfall action in case of the tropical cyclones so in this way you would have been easily able to write about the different color codes and if you talk about the uh, warnings the warnings issued by the imd they are basically issued in four stages the warnings is uh, the warning are issued by the imd in four stages the first stage is the pre cyclone the first stage first stage is the pre cyclone watch okay it is the pre cyclone watch you can make jottings if you want uh, or else we will be coming up with the model answers okay just like our previous year question booklets uh, previous year question booklets we have come up in which uh, we have covered all the previous year questions with the best model answers fine similarly in this case as well we will be coming up with the model answers in fact the model answers are already prepared and ready uh, and it is just that we have to provide you with this in the exam uh, in our proper booklet format fine so these are the color codings then the first stage as i said we have the pre cyclone watch then we have the second stage as the um, uh, cyclone alert then the third stage we have the cyclone warning and the post landfall outlook all these stages all these warnings they are undertaken at the different stages at different hours okay if you talk about first stage it is issued in 72 hours then 48 hours 24 hours and the 12 hours in advance expected time of landfall fine then you conclude it appropriately okay what is the significance of these color coded system okay it helps in um, you can say a, a pre warning okay pre warning and thus helps the authorities as well as the people to be prepared to face the disaster and thus save valuable lives okay thus save valuable lives fine so you conclude it with a human aspect i have always stressed in case of uh, geography always try to bring in the human aspect in the conclusion part okay always try to bring in the human aspect in the conclusion part okay let's move on to the next question the next question uh, again this was directly from our crash course series uh, lecture number 8 fine discuss the natural resource potential of the deccan trap here in brief you can simply talk about what is uh, what is about uh, brief about the geomorphological structure of the deccan trap deccan traps are nothing but volcanic volcanic flood flood basalt okay they are nothing but the volcanic flood basalt region of india then you can simply draw a map showing the deccan trap region of india you can draw a map showing deccan trap region of india okay at the side of the corner of your uh, answer booklet just show deccan trap at times most of the people what happen they are uh, do not find enough time uh, in writing the 10 marker answers because uh, the strategy goes that most of the time people uh, prefer to write all the 15 marker questions first so when you are writing 15 marker questions first you will hardly get somewhere around 1 hour to 1 hour and 10 minutes for the last 10 marker question so you don't find enough time so in that case what you can do is rather than writing the entire answers like uh, mineral deposits fertile black soil ground water you can simply draw the map and in the map itself you can write all the information like minerals black soils ground fine so here itself you can write about all the information so that will also help you uh, in providing good marks and in fact it will make your presentation much more better as well as make your map or diagram more informative okay it will make your map or diagram more informative so first you mention all the natural resource potential then the challenges the challenges it has not been asked in the question fine it has not been asked in the question but you have to ensure that as i have said this exam is upsc exam and you are the future administrators 
so being a future administrator if there is any question with respect to uh, asking about the potentials of any particular development so you have to mention some challenges in brief okay you have to mention some challenges in brief associated with those particular potentials and a little bit of way forward or you can give a conclusion which suggests the uh, suggesting as a way forward fine so in conclusion you can talk about the significance of the again the significance of the deccan trap fine you can talk about the uh, significance of the deccan trap not for just that particular region but for india as a whole okay not for that particular region but india as a whole because the deccan trap region is uh, mostly uh, as compared to the other parts of india it is already a little bit of developed the region okay compared to the other parts of india fine it is little bit a uh, little bit more developed and fine the development level is little bit higher so it can help in uh, providing employment okay providing employment and help achieve india the goal of uh, let's say demographic dividend and also uh, a 5 trillion dollar economy fine also 5 trillion dollar economy so likewise try to make your conclusion more broader okay give a broad perspective in the conclusion part which is in line with the demand of the question fine right? which should be in line with the demand of the demand of the question fine right? so try to give such answer then let's move on to the next question the question number 7 examine the potential of wind energy in india and explain the reasons for their limited spatial spread okay so it is asking about the limited spatial spread so potential of wind energy so here you can start with some factual data uh, about uh, the wind energy which is already present in india how much uh as per the recent reports around 48 gigawatt of wind energy has already been installed in india fine and india is the fourth largest india is the fourth largest uh wind producing uh wind energy producing country in the world india is the fourth largest wind producing country in the world with a capacity of around 48 gigawatt so in this way you can write a single liner uh, factual data introduction then you move on to the potentials okay what are the potentials of the development of wind energy in india fine as per the reports given by uh, various organizations and institutes especially the ministry always try to utilize some authentic sources in your answers okay do not write anything abrupt if you are not aware of the, any particular ministry or any particular institute theek hai to try to write any particular organization international energy agency you can talk about okay and try to give some relevant data or figure okay because at times in examination we do not uh, remember all the exact figure and the data but we should remember at least one or two data if you are on the basis of that one or two data at least we should we will be in a position to write something extra something more so as per uh, the ministry of new and renewable energy uh, india has a vast coastline and can generate around 120 gigawatt of wind energy in terms of offshore wind then as per the national institute of wind energy at a 100 meter height the wind energy potential is about 300 gigawatt so by giving the references to some institute or ministry you are making your answer more objective and authentic okay do not write anything abrupt okay do not write subjective data try to make your answer more objective by writing relevant data relevant facts okay by giving proper references to relevant organizations okay and institutes then the state of gujarat has the highest potential in terms of wind energy then the highest uh, wind energy is produced in the state of tamil nadu right now 
then the ministry of new and renewable energy has set a target of 5 gigawatt offshore wind installation by 2022 and 30 gigawatt by 2030 fine so these then you can also draw a particular a small map showing the areas which have the potential for the um, uh, for the generation of wind energy in India fine it is mostly al along the western ghats then the flat uh, yeah, yeah, sorry not the flat areas but uh, the uh, Kutch plains you can talk about uh, in the Gujarat fine so these areas they have the some of the highest potential for the generation of wind energy then if you look at the second part the second part it is say, talking about explain the reasons for limited spatial spread okay limited spatial spread if you look at this map uh, if you look at the map here the areas that i have highlighted they are only the along the mostly along the western ghats and some parts of the eastern ghats fine but here also we have large mountain ranges as that of the himalayan mountain ranges but they do not hold that significance because they are because they it is a difficult terrain then secondly it is a seismically active then there are presence of loose sedimentary base so because of these reasons because of these reasons the limited spatial spread is there in case of the himalayan mountain ranges there are other reasons as well for the limited spatial spread of uh, wind energy that is the concentrated wind projects most of the wind projects in india are concentrated in the states of tamil nadu and gujarat as i have already said tamil nadu is the highest uh, wind energy producing state of india and the other highest potential is in the state of gujarat it is because of the low cost of land present uh, provided in these state by the state government fine so all the wind projects have become concentrated in these belt then if you talk about the uh, mainland part of india the mainland india the mainland part of india the wind the wind turbines they need to be installed at a certain specific altitude to achieve optimum energy efficiency as a result of this they have to be set up at a specific locations fine so this again limits the spatial spread then the offshore wind turbines if you talk about they require a very strong foundation they require a very strong foundation it won't float obviously the windmills are way too high uh, high okay the height of the windmills are somewhere around 90 feet okay so uh, it requires robust foundation and structure fine this then further increases the cost of installation okay so this also limits our capacity to uh, put up uh, offshore wind farms fine plus the equipments that are necessary all are mostly imported fine we do not have their manufacturing here in india then concerns also uh, exist with respect to obstructing monsoon winds okay uh, if you look at the map again most of the wind farms are present along the western guards then eastern guards over here so if you talk about the western guards we know that there are uh, movement of the monsoon winds there are sorry, there are this movement of the monsoon winds taking place fine southwest monsoon winds we have moving in so they might obstruct uh, the people local people in these areas they were concerned about that uh, these will obstruct the movement of the monsoon winds and thus uh, obstruct cloud formation and thus there will be less precipitation fine so all these are the concerns then vision the visibility is also affected because of the visibility might get affected because of the wind then there is concerns with respect to movement of the uh, birds as well okay the wind turbines they rotate at a very fast speed and as a result most of the time there have been cases where uh, uh, birds have lost their life then if you talk about the east coast of india it is highly prone to cyclonic activities plus at times there are tsunami as well they might cause an irreparable damage to the onshore as well as the offshore wind turbines fine so all these are the uh, constraints which have restricted the uh, spread of wind energy wind turbines in india fine then you can talk about some 
you can talk about some uh, way forward the government has come up with two initiatives the government has come up with two initiatives to tackle these challenges one is the wind solar hybrid policy and second is the offshore wind energy policy right so again potential it is talking about the potential okay we have explained the reasons or the challenges associated with the limited spatial spread then you go on to giving some way forward giving some suggestions how we can improve how you can improve you give some authentic sources you talk about some government initiatives you talk about some government schemes fine which have been brought up to tackle all these problems fine so the government has come up with two initiatives that is the wind solar hybrid policy and the offshore wind energy policy fine so then you uh, go on to give the conclusion now again give a broad conclusion okay it is the question is broadly talking about wind energy so wind energy a renewable form of energy okay wind energy a renewable form of energy it will help in uh, reducing our carbon footprint okay carbon footprint ke bare mein baat karna environment ke bare mein baat karna theek hai plus it will help in providing clean energy for all theek hai sdg goal ke bare mein baat karna theek hai you can talk about sdg goal clean energy for all okay sdg goal i think it is goal number 7 okay so likewise you can conclude your answer start with some factual data in the body part you address both the aspect first is the potential and the second is the reasons then reasons for limited spatial spread then give some uh, schemes which have the government has come up to overcome these challenges then you conclude it in a broad perspective fine this question was already the data for all this question it is present in our gs1 uh, book gs1 book okay wind energy here all the renewable forms of energy has been covered fine okay? then let's move on to the uh, next question question number 14 what are the forces that influence ocean currents describe their role in fishing industry of the world again i have said that i have already taken this uh, uh, topic in our lecture number 6 geography means crash course in this uh, question you can start with the definition of the ocean currents what do you mean by ocean currents the channelized flow of water uh, on the uh, surface of the oceans okay plus there are also a, a presence of bottom currents as well okay do not forget about bottom currents as well okay do not forget what are the forces that influence ocean currents 99% of the people would have written only about the surface ocean currents they would have written only about the surface ocean currents but do not forget about the bottom currents as well okay so what are the forces there are two basically forces that are responsible for the uh, generation of uh, for the movement of the uh, ocean currents fine there are primary forces the primary forces are the insulation okay the heating of the ocean surface then uh, the second primary force is the uh, wind or the atmospheric circulation then we have the gravity and the coriolis forces all these uh, you people might already be aware of fine then there are some other secondary forces as well the secondary forces like the density salinity and the temperature the density if you talk about the density the cold water uh, the cold water cold water has high density that's why it is little bit heavier okay it is heavy as a result of which it sinks as a result of which we have the generation of the bottom currents okay generation of the bottom currents we have, would have already read about the concept of atlantic amok atlantic meridional ocean circulation iske bare mein already padha hoga there is sinking of a uh, large amount of cold water especially near around greenland fine and this water it circulate it uh, through the entire uh, atlantic ocean then it enters the 
Indian as well as the Pacific Ocean, then over a period of time, it again rises upward and it returns to its original position because of the compensatory current. Okay, so density is there, then salinity with increasing amount of salinity, the density will again increase and again there will be sinking up or uh, sinking of, uh, of uh, water taking place. Fine. So likewise, you can mention all the forces that are responsible. Here I won't be explaining in that detail each and every force, but just a brief overview about the how you would have written the answer. The primary forces, insulation, wind, gravity and the Coriolis force. Fine. Then secondary forces, density, salinity and the temperature. Fine. Then role of ocean currents. The second part, it is asking about describe their role in fishing industry of the world. So what role? We know that the major fishing grounds of the world are present at places where there is mixing of mixing of warm and cold surface currents. Warm and cold surface currents. So wherever there is mixing of warm and cold surface current, okay, there you will find ideal condition, ideal uh, temperature of the water, ideal presence of nutrients, large amount of presence of phytoplankton, okay, for the breeding up of fish. So these are mostly present along the areas, on, uh, especially like the Newfoundland bank, okay, Newfoundland bank to the uh, east of uh, east of uh, North America, okay, North American continent, Newfoundland Bank, you will find that uh, near in between uh, to the east of USA and Canada region, fine. Newfoundland Bank is there. So it is one of the largest area or uh, largest fishing ground of the world. Then uh, along the coast of Japan, fine. So where there is mixing of water, then Plus, there are areas where there is upwelling taking place. Okay, wherever there is upwelling taking place, there will be nutrients brought onto the surface. There will be nutrients brought onto the surface by the upwelling currents and which will provide ground for the uh, breeding of the fish. Okay, for breeding of the fish. So, Again, the upwelling current, the mixing warm and cold current, they play a good role in fishing industry. Then upwelling uh, currents also play a good role in fishing industry. The upwelling currents are usually for, uh, found in areas uh, where there are cold currents present. Okay, where there are cold currents present. For example, we have the Canary current, we have the Benguela current, fine. we have the Peruvian current or also called as the Humboldt current. Okay, at all these places, you will find there are large fishing grounds. Fine. Then the, we know that uh, if you talk about the surface ocean currents, the surface ocean currents, they, it is the steady flow. Okay, ocean currents, it is, they move in a steady flow. There is steady flow of ocean currents, fine, across the oceans in a same direction. Okay all the ocean currents are almost moving in the same direction. That's why they help the movement of ships. They help the movement of ships. So they are helping fishermen. They are helping fishermen to move freely and thus uh, catch a lot amount of fish. Fine. So helping the fishermen to ship. Then there are also other like uh, fish location, we know that there, wherever there will be mixing, we will be easily able to identify the fishing location, fine, plus the fishing route, then the nutrient balance, we have already talked about the upwelling currents, they help in nutrient balance, plus they help in managing the oxygen flow, fine. We know that the deep bottom currents, there is usually the presence of oxygen level is very less. But because of uh, bottom currents like Atlantic Meridional Ocean Circulation, lot of oxygen dissolved uh, in the air, uh, dissolved in the water, upper surface water will be carried downwards, okay, will be carried downwards, fine. So likewise, uh, you can 
talk about the role of the fishing industry uh, role of ocean currents in the fishing industry then you give a proper conclusion okay the question is about the ocean current so right broad perspective here it is talking about just one role of ocean current that it is helping in fishing industry but the question is basically about the ocean current so right broad uh, significance about the ocean currents for example you can talk about the ocean currents they help in maintaining the heat and salinity budget okay so you can talk about they help in maintaining the heat and the salinity budget of the world then you can uh, if possible then you can also talk about they help in uh, maintaining the nutrient cycle okay they help in maintaining the nutrient cycle fine so likewise you can give a proper conclusion then they also help in dispersal of plant seeds across the planet okay these ocean currents they also help in dispersal of the plant seeds okay so try to write the proper conclusion and your task will be done again i'll repeat define what is ocean current channelize flow of water then you move on to the main part body part where you can talk about the forces primary force and the secondary force then you go on to write the role in the fishing industry and give a proper broad conclusion fine right? let's move to the next question describing the distribution of rubber product producing countries indicate the major environmental issues faced by them in crash course in mains crash course series uh, i took uh, almost all the major crops uh, cotton jute sugarcane uh, tea etc but uh, somehow i missed about the rubber uh, somehow i missed about the rubber and in the examination we got the rubber so i am not claiming anything over here that uh, this was from uh, our mains crash course series or anything as such fine so but this uh, part it is uh, again a very static and straightforward question fine uh, because our, we do read about the uh, different plantation crops so in that rubber is also one of the important crop so do not uh, miss out on any of the important crops uh, that are essential fine then uh, describing the distribution of rubber producing uh, countries here you can again uh, talk about some uh, factual data related to the rubber production okay uh, as uh, here we have given the asia is the largest producer of rubber in the world and that produces somewhere around 91% of the world production then the other major producing area is the africa and then we have the south america then you can move on to writing some geographical condition okay geographical conditions for rubber cultivation it hasn't been asked anywhere in the question but try to write it in one or two line that will give a very good uh, that will set a very good um, tone to your answer for example here you can write geographic condition they are require moist and humid climates with heavy rainfall more than 200 cm and it grows mostly in the equatorial climate where temperature is well above 25 degrees celsius almost throughout the year so this two line these will help you in fetching that extra mark okay it will help you in fetching that extra mark then you go on to the main part because already it is a 15 marker question so there is good amount of space for your uh, to write 250 words is good enough. the distribution you can simply show this with the help of map okay so it is being an mostly an equatorial uh, crop plant okay being an equatorial uh, region plant then uh, you mostly obviously there will be equatorial countries like china indonesia malaysia uh, equatorial means uh, those lying within the tropics okay i am not specifically talking about the equatorial countries okay uh, it is this crop it is basically in the uh, basically in the tropical regions fine because these geographical conditions they are mostly present in the tropical regions so uh, china indonesia malaysia then most of the southeast asia india then in case of uh, africa uh we have the congo we have liberia ghana 
then in case of south america brazil is the major producer right and in the some countries in the central america right so you can draw the map and there itself you can write some information for example you can talk about thailand 31% of the uh, global total global uh, production of rubber comes from thailand okay recently it has uh, increased then indonesia is there then malaysia is there if you are right drawing the map and if you are writing this little bit of information for example this 31% of global trade so by just simply marking thailand okay marking thailand here if you are writing 31% of global trade then also it will be good okay you need not write the data again you need not write the data again in case of uh, indonesia you can write the major islands where it is grown grown java okay sumatra borneo okay so likewise you can simply write about all the information fine okay? in india also it is grown uh, the largest producing state in india uh, it is kerala if you talk about india in india uh, rubber is grown in more than 16 states okay so rubber is grown uh, at a large scale also in the northeastern states also we will find rubber cultivation fine okay. then west africa and other countries uh if you are drawing if you are representing it with the help of map this will save this entire content okay it will save your entire content then you can directly jump on to writing the environmental issues caused by the rubber industry the major issues are nothing but the processing are basically related with the processing okay processing of rubber in the industries so release of chemicals we have then odor it's uh, the bad smell that is uh, because of the uh, poisonous gases like hydrogen sulfide ammonia amines okay then uh, production of carcinogenic gases okay they produce they can cause cancer okay so extra precaution has to be then the discharge of water from the rubber industry is is also a concern then whatever the chemicals that are used for processing uh, the rubber the leaching of those chemicals is also a cause of concern fine so again uh, then you can give a proper conclusion to avoid or minimize the pollution there is we need to uh, come up with new technologies okay we need to come up with new technologies uh, to uh, reduce the environmental pollution and make the efficient best use of the rubber crop okay of the rubber as a resource fine so give introduction give some factual data as a introduction then write some geographical uh, conditions uh, favorable for the cultivation of rubber then uh, go on to draw the map map is essential draw the map showing major countries you can make your map more informative by writing the information there itself right then you move on to uh, the environmental issues okay especially related with the rubber industry especially related with the processing of the rubber fine right? and then you give a proper conclusion in conclusion you are you should be suggesting some way forward okay like the uh, knowledge of chemicals manpower training proper selection of material developing new techniques methods okay so likewise you can conclude your answer okay. let's move on to the next question question number 16 mention the significance of straits and isthmus in international trade uh, while discussing oceanography while ta- uh, taking lectures on oceanography uh, in mains crash course i did talk about the uh, major choke points of the world okay at that time i did talk about the major choke points of the world so choke points straight if uh, that information would have helped you in some way or the other it would have been a great thing if you would have been able to recall all those things but anyways i won't like to claim that this was from our section fine so in this case here you can simply define uh, what is strait and isthmus you can give a brief uh, definition strait a narrow body of water that connects two larger bodies of water then give an example like the hormuz strait it connects the persian gulf and the gulf of oman fine then you talk about the isthmus give definition about isthmus a narrow strip of land remember the difference between the strait and the isthmus isthmus is basically a narrow strip of land okay that connects two larger land masses and separate 
two bodies of water like the isthmus of panama okay like the isthmus of panama you can also draw a map uh, if possible okay here you can show north america fine here you can show the isthmus of panama छोटा सा मैप बना देना ठीक है स्ट्रेट भी दिखाना होगा तो यू कैन शो अबाउट दी मलक्का स्ट्रेट ओके यू कैन टॉक अबाउट दी मलक्का स्ट्रेट इज देयर फाइन एक छोटा सा मैप ड्रॉ करके मलक्का स्ट्रेट दो नॉट दैट क्लियर बट इट विल बी सफिशिएंट द एग्जामिनर विल अंडरस्टैंड ठीक है वो हमसे ज़्यादा होशार है ठीक है तो कुछ भी ऐसा ड्रॉ करके यू कैन शो इस्तेमस एज द पनामा एंड द स्ट्रेट इस्तेमस इट इज कनेक्टिंग दी टू कॉन्टिनेंटल टू लैंड मासस एंड इट सेपरेटिंग दी टू ओशन बॉडीज फाइन सेपरेटिंग दी टू वाटर बॉडीज एंड कनेक्टिंग दी टू लैंड मासस इफ यू टॉक अबाउट दी स्ट्रेट अ नैरो पैसेज ऑफ वाटर अ नैरो चैनल ऑफ वाटर सेपरेटिंग दी टू लैंड मासस फाइन so straight uh, define them then the question is asking about the significance the question is asking about the significance of strait and isthmus in international trade uh, you people in the examination uh, we won't be able to remember more points with respect to international trade okay because they are nothing but uh, the main arteries or the main transportation routes of uh, international trade but in this case try to write whatever you whatever you remember because the question is asking about mention okay the question is using the word mention so simply mention whatever economy or trade related aspect you are aware of uh, with respect to the trade carried through waterways international waterways okay trade carried through international waterways i am stressing on international because of the straits and isthmus okay inland waterways ke bare mein mat likh ke aana theek hai so mention the significance of straits and isthmus in international trade then you write around 90% of the global trade takes place through uh, sea routes major international sea routes then they are the major pathways for transport of uh, major goods like energy goods like natural gas petroleum okay engineering goods then heavy engineering goods then bulk minerals okay iron ore coal okay copper cobalt fine all these then major minerals processed mineral steel okay all these are transported through sea routes then they are the major transit point for the merchant ships okay uh, you would have uh, recently seen a uh, news about the blockade which took place in egypt in suez canal okay egypt in suez canal egypt earns uh, every year egypt earns around 6 to 7 billion dollars only from the tolls okay only from the tolls collected from transiting ships okay all the ships that pass through suez canal they have to pay a certain amount of fees to the suez canal authority which is the owned by egypt okay a psu of the egypt government so they are earning 6 to 7 billion dollar only from the tolls fine right? then they are the major choke points of the world uh, any disruption in the uh, any disruption in these uh, choke points it will cause a disruption in the supply chain of goods for example the suez canal again uh, this year only there was this blockade because of the evergreen uh, ship okay as a result of which immediately the prices of certain goods they began to rise and thus there is a domino effect because of the rise in prices fine then petroleum from the middle eastern region you talk about then you mention some important uh, uh, you can say uh, the straits and the isthmus the important straits we talk about the strait of hormuz is quite important then the panama isthmus uh, through which we have the artificially built panama canal then the isthmus of suez through which we have the suez canal then the strait of malacca in the indian ocean fine so you talk about the uh, different uh, economic significances 
then the other economic significance about this trait is most of the almost 100% of the people would when talking about this trait and isthmus they would have written only about the ships but remember that these traits they are also utilized okay by the overflight by the overflight aircraft overflight air carriers okay overflight air carriers so these overflight aircrafts they have certain rights while they are passing through the straits okay niche se nahi jate upar se hi jate hai okay but they have to follow certain rules okay these overflight aircrafts these passages are also utilized by aircraft uh, during their passage fine let's say for example a flight is moving from mumbai to uh, to usa or to uk okay it might use this these straits okay because they are the safe passage routes okay they are the safe passage routes fine then uh, use just give a passing reference to other significant uh, international um, straits there that is we have the babel mandeb strait the gibraltar strait is there the taiwan strait is there then the sunda strait so there are n number there are large number of straits and isthmus and the question is simply talking about the mention so you mention few of them mention five six of them and your task will be done okay try to write as many points as you can okay here in the model answer you can see here there are 13 points so it gives an impre, uh, impression to the examiner okay that he has written he or she has written 13 13 different points okay bhali ek hi likha hai bas usko thoda bahut yaha wa change karke badhaya gaya hai theek hai so you also have to learn the skill and the skill will come only by only by uh, only by practicing right the skill will come only by practicing then uh, the next uh, thing the next question let's move on to the uh, then you give a proper conclusion you give a proper conclusion fine in the conclusion uh, you can talk about try to go again in a broader way try to talk about the try to talk about the other strategic importance of straits okay not just international trade the straits they do not have just economic significance but they also have the strategic military significance okay straits have a strategic military importance as they are the major choke points of the world okay they are the major choke points of the world that is why they have a very strategic significance because any uh, the country who rules the oceans rules the world it there's a saying the country that rules the oceans they rule the world because the major uh, na- you can say aircraft carriers submarines okay they all have to pass through these straits okay uh, while they are navigating across the uh, across the globe right so they these choke points they hold a very strategic significance thus in order to ensure a uh, free movement of uh, shipping vessels many nations they have their military as well as naval bases in and around these choke points for example there are uh, choke points uh, like jibouti at babel mandeb strait jibouti here there are naval military bases of usa france as well as china fine okay? so they hold a quite strategic significance so you mention about the significance of straits and isthmus in the international trade then let's move on to the next question i'll just uh, uh, summarize this question define uh, so you can define uh, what is strait what is isthmus in uh, give with example if you want you can draw a small map fine then you go on to mention the significance and conclude it with in a broader perspective then let's move on to the next question the question number 17 troposphere is very significant atmospheric layer that determines weather processes and how this was a very straightforward question fine so why um, uh, it is talking about um, why there are all the weather phenomena taking place in the troposphere so you just have to mention the reasons 
so in brief you talk about the troposphere okay the lowest layer of the atmosphere it spreads up to a height of somewhere around uh, on an average around 20 kilometer okay then you give a brief introduction then you can draw the uh, atmo uh, map showing different layers of the atmosphere troposphere tropopause stratosphere stratopause then mesosphere and the uh, exo uh, th uh, thermosphere right so there are in between other layers as well but no need to mention each and every minute detail so because our main focus is troposphere right then you go on to explain how the different weather processes are taking place in the troposphere so the basic the basic uh, cause of weather phenomena is the uh, presence of the atmosphere almost 85% almost 85% of the atmosphere's total mass it is present in the, within the troposphere okay 85% of the total atmosphere's uh, mass it is present within the troposphere fine because of this what happens <clears throat> because of this we have the hydrological cycle is there the greenhouse effect is there okay and the question is asking about how fine so the, if you talk about the troposphere, the troposphere is the lowest layer of the atmosphere. It is in direct contact with the earth surface. It is in direct contact with the earth surface. It is therefore very sensitive to processes occurring at this level. Okay. So being in direct contact with the earth surface, the layers of the atmosphere, the layers of the atmosphere just above the surface of the earth, they get heated because of the convection from the earth surface because of the convection from the earth surface and that causes the conversion generation of the convection currents so these convection currents because of these convection currents the layers of the atmosphere above they get heated and as a result the pattern of wind sets in plus we also have the generation or the formation of the low pressure cells as we know all along the entire equator because of intense insulation the air uh, near the earth surface it continuously rises as a result of which we there is generation of the low pressure so here you can uh, also try to write if you want you can try to write uh, the entire mechanism in a sequence format okay like heating okay convection okay then generation of pressure gradients generation of pressure gradient then movement of wind patterns movement of wind pattern so likewise you can uh, just write your answer and thus movement of wind pattern and thus uh, various weather phenomena and thus various weather phenomena so you can just simply write it in a sequence form or you can write it in a, a entire you can uh, say point form okay so move heat and moisture movement of low pressure high pressure then thus the formation of clouds will be taking place and thus the forms of different forms of precipitation there will be rain there will be sleet snow and uh, freezing rain okay so different uh, types of precipitation will be taking place then there are also occurrences of cyclones thunderstorms tornadoes anticyclones monsoon heat waves cold waves local winds breezes so because of all these this mechanism because of this mechanism all the other weather phenomena are also taking place fine then plus there are movement of jet streams the jet streams they do not move exactly in the troposphere but at a little bit of higher end of the troposphere mostly in the tropopause okay but they have significant impact on the weather system in the troposphere for example we know the shifting of the uh, westerly jet stream north of the himalayas and the setting of the tropical easterly jet stream on the peninsular part of India is the major major cause for the onset of monsoon in India. Plus, we also have the formation of polar vortex. Okay, polar vortex formation news. Miss Fine. So 
all these weather phenomena are taking place in the troposphere so okay so remember the sequence remember the uh, you would have been easily able to write the answer fine then uh, you talk about some impact of global warming on the troposphere this has not been asked it is not asked but if you give a passing reference then it will be very good it is they say now that uh, addressing the sub parts okay the sub parts or uh, most of the topos copy if you would have seen they tend to write some extra information which has not been asked fine so in this case uh, you can write about what will be the impact of global warming on the troposphere just give a brief mention especially because of the heating and the uh, excessive warming and the effect of greenhouse effect the um, you can say the thickness of the troposphere it is a uh, increasing little bit upward okay it is increasing little bit upward and since the troposphere is increasing little bit upward there is effect of uh, greenhouse gases thus there will be more uh, you can say more erratic weather phenomena taking place more erratic weather phenomena taking place you can give references or examples for example you can talk about uh, more greenhouse effect and more heating because of that the glaciers are melting at a fast rate the recent floods in pakistan mostly because of the glacial melting and heavy rainfall fine then the heat waves in the temperate region all these can be attributed to the uh, changing global warming in the troposphere fine then you give a broad conclusion okay troposphere the how you can give a very broad significance or the importance of the troposphere in the conclusion we all know that uh, the entire life uh, on the planet earth is uh, only within the troposphere plus all the resources that are present necessary resources like food water gases oxygen for humans uh, animals uh, carbon dioxide for plants all these are present only within the troposphere fine so that is why the troposphere is an important layer in earth's atmosphere and thus we need also need to take care of the arresting the global warming and protecting our entire race okay protecting our entire human race should be our prime task fine so in terms of conclusion always think about that particular topic in a very broad and futuristic way fine because in every question i have stressed on writing proper conclusion and proper introduction body part you will you know over a period of time by practicing you will definitely able to write it and uh, by reading content you will definitely able to write it but try to restrict yourself with respect to introduction because ek bar introduction likh diya the moment we write the introduction we immediately are able to uh, set ourselves into a particular flow fine and in terms of conclusion always try to go little bit in a broad perspective so i hope this uh, discussion would have helped you do go through our gs1 booklet okay uh, our gs uh, booklet they are quite good because you would have seen most of the information is already provided most of the static along with the current affairs is already provided into it then these um, crash courses that we conduct okay they are also quite um, beneficial because most of the things have already come from that section then in case of uh, geography optional also we have started with our daily answer writing for geography as well as some other optionals uh, in that we are also we are focusing mostly on simple questions which actually come in the exam this is our proof okay three questions directly from the crash course okay so the 15 hours of a lecture would have easily fetched you are providing you with an advantage of around 50 marks okay 15 ghante mein 50 mark ka advantage mil raha hai aur sara ready made content mil raha hai isse badhiya cheez aur kya hi ho sakti hai theek hai so do focus on all these things and do not ignore a uh, writing aspect we have started we are we are already conducting our daily answer writing one question hardly one question every day okay so start writing as much as you can but initially at this stage you can start with at least one question per day fine so that's it from my end thank you